started looking at the subject of loving God with all your hearts. And I think we ended up with Psalm 119, 69, and 70. Let me read it to you again. The arrogant have forged a lie against me with all my heart. I will observe your precepts. Their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in your law. One translation reads, <clears throat> their hearts are covered with grease. And so we, uh, we know that the love of the Lord is ever faithful, from, from everlasting to everlasting, His mercy never ends. But the question, based on observation, is if that is so, how come it seems like the love of the Lord has difficulty flowing in other people's lives? And that is basically a tension that we always experience because Christians, I think we made your own confession. Especially nowadays with the emphasis on the grace of God, it seems like it's free for all. Like you, can, you cannot stop sinning and yet with almost no repentance, people assume that uh, everything will be yours. In fact, it, it uh, goes along with our teaching on Sundays on the inheritance of the saints. The emphasis have shifted. And now there is this removal from the concept of holiness. Franklin Graham this week came up with an article in Christianity Today. And he was, he was talking about progressive Christianity. He said, progressive Christianity have, received, have removed the doctrine of holiness in the church. And the church is not complaining. And his point being, if the church doesn't complain, then the church is in cahoots with progressive Christianity. That is, it's okay to live in holy lives. But that is not so. So, one of the honest questions that we need to ask ourselves is, are we happy with the way the grace of God is flowing in our lives? Because as what we are discussing on Sundays, on Sunday now, well, last Sunday at least, the inheritance of the saints. Uh, the, the basic truth is this, ask and it will be given unto you. If you ask and it's not being given to you, you have to pause. I say, why is it not being given to me? If it says all things are possible to him that believes and nothing is possible to us who believes, Something is amiss. And that is when you, you uh, allow your faith to actually be part of your life. Because what's the use of gathering, for example, what's the use of gathering together if we're not studying the Word of God, if we're not seeing the face of God? That's the purpose of gathering together. It's a fellowship of the saints, a worship of the Lord, and study of His Word. Those are the three basic elements. You can remove the other stuff. You know, you, 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 will not, you will not find a lot of what is being done in the church today to be present in the assembly in the New Testament, even in the Old Testament. So you have to ask yourself the question, so why are we gathering, for example, if the elements of, of uh, an assembly is not being fulfilled? You know, so. Now we have to ask ourselves the question, what is it that prevents one from realizing the love of God in their lives? You can translate that in our normal relationship. Somebody tells you they love you, and then suddenly the blessings of love is not flowing, like parents to children, children to parents, spouses to spouses. If the love is flowing, there are corresponding blessings that, that goes along with it. Okay, so what prevents one from realizing the love of God in their lives? Number one, primary to this discussion is the subject of sin. Because sin separates. You have to start on that. I know that the word sin is being avoided nowadays, but sin is still in the scriptures. So when, when the love of God is not flowing, primary to that discussion is a subject of sin. You cannot avoid that. Isaiah 59 verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Now, the prophet was addressing the people of the Lord. And he said, your sin separates. Now, they are the people of God already. But even though they are the people of God, the Lord says, it's still because of your sin. By the way, that sin there in context is active sins. They are living in sins. That sin is still separates. If there is sin, it separates. Like I always use the illustration of sports. 
My two young boys went with their kuya yesterday to YMCA. They came home and they want to kiss me. So I said, whoa, <laughs> hold it. Take a shower. The moment they came home, came home, take a shower. Why? You stink. Now, does it mean I don't love them? I love them. But their stench prevents me from hugging them, prevents me from, from uh, having fellowship with them. So they, I told them to take a shower, you see. Our sin is like that to God. If sin prospers in our lives, sin separates. This is an address to his people. And the Bible even says, your sins cause God to hide his face, face from you. He doesn't hear. Again, honest, honest question that Christians should be asking is this. When you pray, is God listening? You know that he's listening when he answers your prayers. Uh, I think the longer we have our relationship with God, the better it should be the listening. It's like a friendship. When you're new friends, not really. But the moment you are old friends, you even anticipate. Like my wife always brags that she can anticipate my needs now. That means the channel of communication is open. When our channel of communication with God is open, God even anticipates our needs. That's what the Bible says. What does the Bible say about that? God anticipating our needs. Huh? What? <laughs> what does it say? Because God anticipates our needs, right? So what does the Bible say about that? When we pray. He knows our needs before we even ask Him. You see, that's the intimacy of the relationship. Now, now it, doesn't pre, it doesn't say, don't ask anymore. It's still God wants us to ask. It's just like in any other relationship. Telling you faith is more practical than you think. Like in any other relationship, your, your parents may know your needs, but they still, want, they still want to hear you say, Mom, Dad, I want this. There's, there's a certain uh, music to it. You know, like, like I know that DJ, the moment I pick her up from school, I know that she is hungry. And her normal speech is, oh, I never ate this breakfast. I've never, eat, I did not eat anything since last night. She will, she will play drama. And so my, my immediate question to her is, DJ, I know that she did not eat every time I pick her up uh, from, from school. But I always ask her this question, DJ, are you hungry? What will be her answer? Yes, Papa, I am hungry. DJ, do you want to eat? She will say, yes, I want to eat. What do you want to eat? It never gets old. I know it never, it never gets old. I always like asking her, what do you want to eat? It never gets old. Why? Because it's relationship. It, is, it will only get old if I'm upset. You know, or if she is upset. That's when it gets old. But when relationship is fresh, it never gets old. We ask the same questions. That's fellowship. However, if sin is standing between us and God, God says, I will not even listen. These are his people. And God says, I will not listen. It is sad today when a big, a big portion of the church is discounting sin. Like it doesn't exist. Well, it's preventing God from hearing our prayers. Romans 14.23. Romans 14, 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is a sin. So the second thing there is unbelief, I'll discuss it later. But sin manifesting itself in, in unbelief. The moment you put sin between you and God which separates, what is operating now in your life is no longer faith, but unbelief. When sin operates, unbelief walks in. It is impossible to walk by faith if you are walking in sin. These two doesn't come together. And when Christians say, well, you know, um, we're saved now so we can do whatever we want, sin and faith doesn't come together. Whatever is not of faith is sin. A clear distinction. So I believe because of that, it's best that we visit that passage in Galatians that talks about seeds of life and seeds of death, or works of the flesh and works of faith. 
Galatians 5.19. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident. Meaning, isn't that obvious? It, it's, it's, it's like when we're having conversation, hey, is it, is it wrong for me to steal? Sometimes you look at it and say, are you crazy? Isn't that obvious? Paul is arguing the same thing. The, uh, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just I, as I forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Isn't it obvious? That's what Paul is saying. You walk in immorality, you walk in the lust of the flesh. Isn't it obvious? You're walking in, this, in sin. And you will not inherit the kingdom of God. In context, you will not participate in kingdom life. You see, these are clear passages, very elementary, very basic, but we are watering it down now. Like, it's, it's okay now. I mean, massive in the church today, again, is, and I'll keep barking at this, is the acceptance of homosexuality. Again, in Christianity today, Franklin Graham came up with this article. He was interviewed, and he said, this LGBTQ program, the church is winking at it. It is sin. That's what Franklin Graham said. And he is, sometimes it feels like he's a lone voice there because the evangelicals have already accepted it. He still separates. And Paul's argument is, isn't it obvious? Like, if, like if somebody asks you now, hey, listen, Darren, is homos- I think the homosexuality is okay, right? You look at that, man, isn't it obvious? It's sin. You know? There are certain things that are obvious. You know, you come to home and you smell and you ask your mom, mom, do you think I need to take a shower? What, what are you, crazy? You smell yourself. You know, you smell yourself. Wala naman akong katabi. Well, if you smell yourself and you can, you can even smell your stench, isn't that obvious you have to take a shower? But when you have to ask yourself, it's annoying when you, when you have to ask, Mom, do I have to take a shower? You stink! And you're asking me, get out of here! Hit the shower room. You know? It's this argument that Paul is making. The moment you see these things, it is obvious it's sin. But of course, the church right now is saying it's not obvious. Because some of this, we have learned how to live with. We have learned how to... If you learn to live with sin, if you learn to live with stench, you will feel comfortable with it. Look at the uh, streets of Chicago where there are homeless people. You ask yourself, how in the world can they live like this? They have gotten used to it. Now, can you guys imagine yourself laying down under one of the viaducts of Chicago where the birds are poo, laying down your mat and sleeping there? putting on so many layers of jacket. Can you imagine yourself doing that? Perhaps if you are normal, you will say, no, I cannot. Of course you cannot because you are not there. That's the same concept that those people have when they began. However, they have gotten used to it. Mind you, I think when, when the Chicago Bears of 85 had their anniversary when they won the Super Bowl, they gathered as many as they can gather. They found one of those athletes and homeless now in Chicago, living in, in one of the viaducts, dirty. They have to dress him up, uh, shower him, and give him suit for the celebration. The guy, the guy was rich. <laughs> You're a Super Bowl a champion. The guy was rich, you know. And he went down to the gutter. He had gotten used to it. Hey, well, that's one of the dangers that we have to, to, to face. We want the love of God to flow in our lives. We should never get used to any of these sins. We should never get used to any of these things. We get used to them, it it makes our hearts callous. Nothing now, people argue, nothing shall separate us from the love of God. I agree. And believers always have the love of God, always have the love of their Father. Let me read it to you, Romans 8.35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? 
Will tribulation or distress <clears throat> or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered a sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. None that was mentioned can separate us is sin. But persecution, distress, famine, all caused by persecution. None can separate us from him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Now people, now I've heard uh, Christians preach this, and this is a biblical preaching, but it's very acceptable. They say, even if you sin, it will not separate you from the love of God. We just read a passage from Isaiah, your sin separates you from it. Sin separates None of those mentioned in Romans chapter 8 is sin. It all refers to persecution. Sin separates. I'm telling you, sin separates. I don't know why people are changing it. That is a doctrine from the scriptures. Sin separates, it is still does. By the way, it's the same thing that separates us from each other. You violate me, you separate yourself from me. When we act like Philippians, say, it's okay. You're a hypocrite. You know something happened inside. Sin separates. It separates man's relationship with God. It separates man's relationship with man. Because that is the nature of sin. It's adversarial. The very source of sin is the devil. His name, Satan, means hostility. It means adversarial. It separates. Sin always separates, you know. I'm telling you, a, a lot of people who violated trust from each other, it separates. Yeah. I have a friend in the Philippines who were partners for so many years. Man, I'm telling you, he, he, he removed my name from our board. And Brother Willie was asking me, uh, because the, the guy asked for forgiveness and all is forgiven. And so, Brother Willie asked me, well, Brother Jose, what if he volunteers to volunteer again for our ministry? I said, goodbye. I said, he is forgiven. I said, nothing between us, but he will never work with me. I said, God has to speak to me. And say so he'll work with me. Why? Because sin separates. You say, where in the world? Is Have you read of what happened between Paul and Mark? The guy abandoned them. What did Paul say? Whoa, no. No. Barnabas came along saying, yes, that's my nephew. What happened? Barnabas failed. It was only because of the works of Peter that Mark was reformed and he became repentant and became productive and Paul allowed him back. That means Mark has to prove himself. Why? Because sin separates. When you ignore this basic principle, you will err. And that's why we have lousy doctrines of forgiveness. You say, oh, it's okay, I'm loving. No, you're not loving. You don't address the sin. You know, if I have a wound, an open wound, and it is infected, and all I did is bandage it. Never apply medication. Never apply the, the never consider the fact that it needs rehabilitation. You will not be helping me. Listen, sin separates. None of what was mentioned in Romans 8, 35 and on is referring to sin. Because we read in Isaiah, sin separates. Now, having said that from our point last week, <clears throat> if there are fats in our hearts, meaning if our hearts are clogged because of sin, we will not be able to receive the love of God in our hearts. What happens if your heart is clogged? Stroke. <laughs> Why? Why will there be stroke? Because the blood doesn't flow. That's all it is. You, 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 um, you simplify. That's why there is, uh, how, do, how do you call that? When they, no, no, when they do something with that so that the blood will flow. It's the, not, this is the other one. No, no, no. Aside from stand, there's another one. 
Bypass. The bypass is for that. One part of the vein is, is clogged. The, the blood can't flow. The artery is, is clogged. So they'll bypass that. Yeah. When your heart is clogged, the nutrients, by the way, nutrients is not because you eat some, oh, I ate some banana. No. No, that's not it. You have to have a normal digestive system. They will digest it. And all the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals will flow through what? Through the air? Through the blood. <laughs> it flows through the blood. <laughs> it flows through the blood. So, so that, that blood, life, that's why life is in the blood. All that is required by life, physically, is transmitted through the blood. When your arteries that flows in out of your heart is clogged, what happens? You die. <laughs> that's why they have stent, they have bypass, they have, they have heart bypass to bypass those clogs. And they'll clean it up, you know. So that the nutrients will flow. Because if the nutrients can't be pumped by your heart, you'll die. That's the same thing. From Psalm 119, 69, and 70, if your heart is surrounded by fats, that is sin, it's going to clog. It'll cause death. Okay? Then we will, God wants to, to give you the love. You're receiving the preaching. You're reading your word, perhaps. Well, most probably you will no longer read your word. People are praying for you. Most probably you will no longer be praying because your heart is clogged. You will, you will say talking prayers. But this is one thing I've learned about faith. When your faith is okay, you will really pray. When your relationship with God becomes asked, then you will no longer pray. It's like, it's like if you have a good relationship with your spouse, you talk all the time. You know, you communicate all the time. The moment something is wrong, you stop talking. Same thing with God. Your faith is no longer operant. You'll stop praying. So when, when, when people who are backsliders say, well, I pray, they're liars. They don't, you cannot possibly pray while backsliding. You'll probably say things like, God help me, that's it. You will not be able to communicate. Why? Because sin separates Sin separates. These are basic truths that we should never forget. So that's the, what's the other thing? By the way, that, that includes negative thoughts. Negative thoughts are forms of temptations. Not all negative thoughts are sins. You, to be tempted is not sin. To succumb temptation is sin. But that's negative thoughts, okay? Pride is another sin that can prevent us from realizing the love of God in our lives. Say pride. Now, following <clears throat> what we think, feel, and desire, okay, following what we think, feel, and desire. So we have thinking, we have thoughts, we have feelings, we have desires. So following what we think, feel, or desire over the expressed will of God is pride. That's pride. Anne will be fighting, with, for example, with John. When John, oh, no, this is not sin, okay? This is just household argument. But good illustration anyways. Anne will tell John, John, this is how you do dishes. And John will say, Mama, I have my method. And Anne will say, but this is how it should be done. John will insist on his method, so it's not sin. But Anne will counter, you are so proud. Why? Because Anne expressed her desire. He went against it. She considers it pride. Now, that is not sin because it's just techniques on how to wash dishes. I mean, I don't care what your technique is for as long as the dishes are clean. I mean, you can have all the techniques. If it's still dirty, useless. That is sin. <laughs> have you ever put some of your dishes in the dishwasher? And then you, you, you take one glass to get some water, and after you, you uh, pour water, it's bubbling. What does it mean when it's bubbling? You have a process, it's still dirty. <laughs> yeah? you, have a, you went to the process, it's still dirty. Okay? But in terms of God, if God has an expressed will, and you tell the Lord, I have my thoughts, I have my feelings, 
I have my desires. I'll put it over your expressed will. That is pride. Okay? That is pride. When you want to surpass God and suppress His will, that is pride. Now, you put, when you put yourself over the Word of God or over God, you are, you, are, uh, you are putting yourself above God and His community of the faithful ones. And there is one prime example to that in the Scriptures. Who is it? Lucifer. Okay. From where? Isaiah. Very good. So let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah 14, verse 13, starting on verse 13. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So this is Lucifer. Um, a lot of commentators believe that uh, Lucifer... Well, the Bible says he was perfect in wisdom, he was perfect in beauty. If there was a beauty pageant in heaven, Lucifer was, was the most beautiful. Okay? So when, when people draw Satan, an ugly person, they're so ignorant of the scriptures. They are actually quoting from ancient Babylonian myths and all the Egyptian mythology about the ugliness of their God. But Lucifer was a beautiful creature. He was very wise. The word demon, the very root word demon means intelligent beings. Okay, so these are, these are fallen angels. And like Christians, when pride sets in, they say that Satan was a worship uh, leader in heaven. I can't establish that though from the scriptures. I know that... that uh, he just doesn't know how to play instruments. He is instrument built in. That's how the Bible describes him. But you, you will never find that uh, he was a worship leader. Although the very presence of instruments in his life, you, you couple it with some of the Psalms, seems to point that he is in the worship area. And the reason why I'm having difficulty accepting that he is the worship leader is because... All the angels love to worship him. Who are the most, if there is such a thing as the most, who do you think are the most worshiping angels in heaven? Who are? Come on. Wow. Now don't say Jesus, okay? <laughs> who? Who are? In Isaiah. The seraphims. The white angels. The seraphims. <laughs> no, there's a new one. Huh? First is Jesus, now it's the white angels. <laughs> Remember, uh, in the day that, that King Uzziah died, there was a vision. Remember that? Now, along with that area of, of chapters, the seraphs were looking, beholding the face of God. They lift up and cry out, holy, holy, holy. And then they bow down. And they lift their face again and they see the face of God. They bow down again. When you see the face of God, you will be helpless. You cannot do anything but worship. So these angels for eternity, they are in the presence of God in heaven. They lift their, uh, their, their face and they recover a little bit, you know. <laughs> and so here, they, sort of, they bow down again and cry out, holy, holy, holy. You see? I, don't, I never saw in the scriptures Lucifer worshiping like that. You see, that's why I'm having difficulty the more I think about it that he is the worship leader. These seraphs, no, Satan was a cherub. These seraphs worship God. They know how to worship. You know? But then this, this, uh, these people, these angels, well, Satan, because he was very beautiful and wise, he said, I might as well be God. You know, Bob, Bob Swords has this book. 
He was a phenomenal worship leader. He's a pastor now. I don't know if he's still alive. But he's got uh, cancer on the throat. And so when, when he talks now, it's, it's, it's very guttural. You can hardly understand. He talks like this. He'll preach like this. Beautiful voice before, but the, the mic is right here. Because he, he just talks like that. And that, this voice is even a lot better. He's just a bad boy because he's got a cancer on the throat. He, he got healed, but his voice never recovered. And he, he made a phenomenal teaching on the bride and his friends, the groom and his friends. And he said that in the old days when, when a bride is going to be married, that, that he will have the, 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 the friends of the bride will, will help her. Make her beautiful. But then the friends of the bride begin to think, I am the beautiful one. And will try to draw the attention away from the bride onto them. I, I don't know if you remember whenever I, oh, well, some of you don't remember. Whenever I officiate a wedding, I, I tell the couple, kayo ang bida. Not the in-laws, the, not the mothers, not the outlaws. Dahil maraming, ano, maraming umi-exena, di ba? The, the groom is waiting. Maybe the groom marches and the bride is marching. Now, the ninong, the, pa, the parents, nahinamatay. Pabayaan mo nang himatay niyan. Yan. Ay, no. <laughs> Hindi naman, ano, sila pa hinimatay. Well, they want the attention and they become loud in, in, the, in the ceremony. They forgot they are not the bride. The center of attention in a wedding is the bride. Not even the groom, actually, the bride. But some people, extra. They want to sing it, you know. And so they make scenes. Oh, sarap ham balusin. Yeah, because, you know, you had your days. You got married 500 years ago and you were lonely. Don't steal somebody's wedding. And by the way, this is how you know pride is creeping in your hearts. Instead of presenting Jesus, instead of worshiping Jesus, you want to be the center of attraction. That's pride. Years ago, when we only had one car, my wife will tell me, oh, you can wait a little bit. You're the pastor anyways. I said, no. I said, I'm the pastor, so I've got to be the one to wait in the church. Because I don't want uh, the temptation to come to me thinking, you are waiting for me. No, you're not waiting for me. That's not in the Bible. Who are you supposed to wait for? Huh? Who are you supposed to wait for? Wait upon the Lord. Did you wait upon the Lord tonight or did the Lord wait upon you? But that's what my Bible says, right? Wait upon the Lord. When you begin to volunteer, and, and the worst of all this is actually, of all the presidents, is, it's, uh, I forgot. I think it's president. The one that was uh, awarded a doctorate in New York. I forgot. I think it's President Manuel Alquesa or something. Uh, was supposed, or somebody was supposed, or makapagal, something like that. I think it's, it's, either, it's either the case of makapagal. One of those presidents, I don't know. They were going to be given a, a uh, honorary doctorate in New York. Fordham University is going to give our president an honorary, honorary doctorate. And you know how Filipinos are. The Marcoses are notorious for this. Uh, the Magsay's eyes are not. They're on time. But the Marcos are notorious for this. And so they will ask the question, is the, are the people there? So the, the president of the Philippines was told, well, the meeting is something like, say, 2 o'clock, when he will be awarded uh, the honorary doctorate. And say, oh, let them wait. Oh, the reporters are there in New York. Well, he was late for two hours. Yeah, the, the Philippine president. When he was late for two hours, he arrived. He thought it was a grand entrance. He was shocked. 
almost all the reporters are gone. The only ones left on the stage are the uh, board of Fordham University. And they have to stay because they will be the one granting the honorary doctorate. And so the president of the university just rushed the ceremony and gave the honorary doctorate. But, but the Philippine president was shocked. How come almost nobody is here? Well, you're late. Now you're late. You see? Now, now when we serve, and this is where, uh, this is where we can detect whether we are allowing pride to get into our hearts. Now, the, the idea is this, because when we allow pride to get into our hearts, then the love of God can't flow. It's fats around your heart. Yeah. If God says this is it, and you say, no, this is what I want. It's your will, it's your thoughts, it's your desire, over. And you can translate this even in policies. And when you think you are exempted, that is pride. Boy, it will clog. That's why I wouldn't allow, you know, if you're no longer paying your tithes, then you're, gonna, you're not going to be part of my leadership. Why? Because if I allow you to remain, then I allow your pride to go over what is stated. That is part of that, you see. That's why you cannot, the moment you put yourself above, that's pride. Yeah. That's why... For example, when you write policies, I always tell department heads, did you meet with your group? Because you, you cannot just simply say, well, this is what I want, and that's pride. Okay, that's pride. And that will clog, that will put fats around your heart. Because God gave us the blessing of human government. And in the church, there's human government involved. God gave it to us. When, when you allow your own thoughts, your own wills, your own desires above the will of God, you are not copying God, you're copying Satan. Jesus said this in Gethsemane, let this cup pass over me nevertheless, not what I desire, not what I'm feeling, not what I'm thinking, but yours be done. Okay? Meaning, the humility of Jesus is in subjecting himself. In Philippines, we have a saying, patigasan. Well, it's actually just pride. Yeah. It's actually just pride. You know. We see it from our children. Oh, anak, kain ka na. Hmm. If you are a good parent, let them starve. Like they'll hurt you. Anak, you, you, have, you, have, you have to eat. No, I will not eat. Until they bend your will because you're very concerned about your kids. You, you bend the will of your parents. You put your will above the will of your parents. That is pride. Uh, Ken Copeland was talking about this guy. He read about the stories of T.L. Osborne, uh, Oral Roberts, how Jesus appeared to them. So when he was in the Philippines, he told the story of this preacher. He said, Lord, I, I am going to fast. I will not get out from fasting until I see you face to face. Yeah. So he went over 40 days. Now, this is a legitimate faith minister. He went over 40 days of fasting. I think on the 42nd, 43rd day, Jesus appeared to him. But he said this. When Jesus appeared to him, Jesus was not smiling. Jesus has turned face and begin to speak to him. He was very happy. But he said, Jesus didn't show any smile. Just a stern face. He went over 40 days in fasting. So Jesus appeared to him and, and just began to speak to him. He was very happy. Now he can, because sometimes, now he can testify, Jesus appeared to me. It feeds his pride. <clears throat> so he went ahead and told everybody, you know what happened to his ministry after Jesus appeared to him? From here, it went down. His ministry got destroyed after Jesus appeared to him. The amazing thing is this. 
He started writing, recollecting what Jesus told him. What Jesus told him is the book of Colossians. Yeah. What Jesus told him is actually in the book of Colossians. And said, what Jesus told me is the book of Colossians. But, but Jesus said something to him that changed him. He told him, I'm warning you, this is the last time. Because his pride, he thought, uh, you know how some people think, if I see Jesus, I can testify that I saw Jesus and, and I will be above all. That's why we have to be very careful with our testimony. We want to be so unique sometimes. We want people to admire us that we do more than others and we are more holy. That's pride right there. That, that is just, just pride. You know, and, and uh, his ministry got destroyed. Yeah, his ministry got destroyed. Pride will, will put fats around your hearts. It will prevent the love of God from flowing. Pride simply put loving self above loving God. Pride is when we totally give ourselves over to what we think and what we desire. And our society is like, well, this is what I think. This is what I want. Then it's no longer a subject to uh, God's will. And boy, our society is like that. Remember, one of the tenets of liberalism is individualism. Boy, how we, how we uh, do that today. This is what I think. This is what I want. That's our conversations now. Pride prospers when we disobey. That's why some people are very happy. You know. Very happy when, when, when they know this is the rule and they violate that. Oh, the store is closed. Watch me, I will open it. Boy, it fits their pride. Yeah. Because that's the rule. The rule is the store, the store closes at 5. Watch me, I'm going to walk in at 5.15. And then when we can get away with it, it, it doesn't feed humility, it feeds pride. Because nobody wants to follow rules by fallen nature. But when you can subject yourself to the will of God, you know, that's... I mean, you, you guys have to be careful. Like dress codes, you know, if you say no, no cleavage. Sometimes when I'm wearing my shirt, DJ will tell me, Papa, you have cleavage. Men have no cleavage, okay? <laughs> uh, but for example, if it's like, well, is it, is it showy enough? Well, sometimes it's just pride. You know, when, when you know the rules and, and you want to change it. When you know that something... Especially, look, in the natural level, if you know that your parents don't like it and you keep doing it to show your parents, that's pride. Yeah. You listen to me, DJ? <laughs> that's pride. Even in the church. When you know it's the church policy and you keep going against it just to show everybody that you can go against it, that is pride. It'll clog God's blessings in your life. God hates pride. Proverbs 8.13 the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. No, now look at this uh, semicolon after. The Lord hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way. Perverted mouth, God says, I hate. So you see, pride, arrogance, perverted mouth. Perverted mouth is a mouth that utters perverse things. That's why we have, we have to be very careful, guys, because, you know, again, for a time it will fly, but our society will continue to be, to be numb about this. When you begin to say that homosexuality is okay, that's perversion. God hates it. The very fact that you utter it, well, there's, some, there's nothing wrong with it. It is contrary to the will of God. That's perversion. Yeah. In the, the Bible says God hates a perverse mouth. God hates pride because it ran immediately it can immediately prevent his love into our hearts. And it, it, it thwarts his purposes. <clears throat> Pride and unbelief are two sins that are continually working to prevent the love of God from, from uh, flowing freely, freely. So the Bible says, humble yourself uh, be, uh, before the Lord and he will lift you up. Humble is to submit yourself 
to it. A lot, a lot of Christians who are knowledgeable of the will of God in their life, when, when something wrong happened, they say, I should have done this. This is what the Bible says. Well, you know that's what the Bible says. Or you know that that is what God told you. Why didn't you do it? Because your pride kicks in. The moment you give priority to your thoughts, feelings, and desires over God's will, that is pride. Okay. So, how does God help us on this one? Okay, because God wants his love to flow freely in our lives, you know. So what can we expect from God? It's just like parenting. What can children expect from their parents so that the parents, well, so that the family will have a God-fearing family? If, if we want to build a God-fearing family that knows the scriptures, there are expectations. Like the children can expect things from their parents. Parents can expect things from their children. Okay, first of all, God allows us to know him and his word or his will. That we can expect that. Do not expect God to hide things from you. Secret, secret is not God's will. Okay? Now people say, well, the Bible says secret things belong to God. I explained that to you a couple of years ago what that means. Okay? But God is not in the business of, of uh, giving out mysteries. Because now he, the mystery of his will has been revealed to us. No secret. Friendship requires no secret. Jesus was talking to his disciples in the Last Supper and saying, oh, now he speaks plainly. Because he said, I call you now friends. He speaks plainly. God always speaks plainly to, to us. Now, because God is willing, and God allows us to know him, know his word, know his will. Therefore, God is looking for people with a willing heart to know. If, if your heart is willing, God will reveal himself to you if, you, if you are willing. If you say, well, I cannot know God, then your heart is not willing. God, God is just looking for willing hearts. So primarily, to know him, his word and his will, to know him, primarily it comes from his word or studying his word. That is our primary source of revelation. The others are not. And I think the modern, you have to, guys, you have to be very careful when you say, God told me this. You've got to be very careful. You know. Uh, you know, when I, was, when I was a young Christian, <clears throat> always very excited when God speaks to me. Uh, but I think the problem that we have going back to pride we want to impress people when we say, God told me this. You have to be very careful. Because when you say, God told me this, and then you don't do it, what you just simply say is, I'm putting my thoughts, will, and desire above God's will. If God tells you, do this, and you say, well, God told me to do this, pastor say, or brother or sister so and so. God told you? Well, you have to be careful because if you don't do it, then you have put your, your thoughts, your desires, and your will above God's will. So you have to be very careful. And in our day and age right now, too many people are just too careless. They just use the name of God told me this. God told me that. Man, the abundance of God said this, even if God is not saying anything. We have to be very careful. Our primary source of revelation is the word. And then, and then we get to know him through body, life, and prayer. To know the depths, heights, uh, width of the love of God is in the, is in the second person plural. When God pours out revelation, the revelation is dropped in the community. You know, you know people have asked me, Pastor Jose, how, how come you, you, you got to know what you know? You know, part of the reason is I'm a teacher. I'm a preacher of the gospel. That, that revelation that I might have received 
is a revelation to the body. It's channeled through me from time to time, but it's through the body. But the moment, say, for example, I begin to say, ang galing-galing ko talaga. You see, I have all the revelation. I have, I have all the knowledge. Well, that's pride. You know. One disciple uh, fellowshipping with, with me and my wife were having lunch. And sometimes the disciples are there. So the disciple of this pastor, I know he's, he's very young. He looked at me and says, Pastor said, do, do, do you know more than my pastor? I, some, some disciples are just like that. They, they lack the tact because, because they are, uh, how do you call this? They are, they are babes in Christ. You know how, how our children will brag that uh, children brag that their parents are better than the other parents. That's immaturity. Okay? So this disciple was, was just telling me we're having lunch with my wife and said, Pastor said, do you know more than my pastor? I immediately answered because I don't want to embarrass the pastor. I said, oh no, your, your pastor knows more than I do. And, and, and he was surprised because, because uh, I immediately answered without, without thinking, oh no, no your, your pastor knows more than I do. It shuts the conversation. You know why? Because that's a question of pride. Yeah. Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think soberly. So body life. You, you, want, you want revelation, revelation comes in the body. And so we do not ignore this. Remember, our church is blessed with this. It's, it's, it's not my, my will. It's the will of the congregation years ago. After you know, after the Sunday service, normally, customary to pastors, after the service, they will stand at the, by the door to shake the hand of people leaving. Well, I, I do that, you know, out of politeness. After I preach, all I want to do is to sit down, but I, I'll stand outside my door and shake a couple of hands because almost nobody leaves. <laughs> Have you noticed that? I, I stand there and people stay here. You know what, what you guys should capitalize on? Because revelation flows in the body. I teach, right? And I, I'm encouraging people to talk about what we learn. You will be surprised you flow into this. And I hope you guys flow into this. Talk about the word that we studied. You will be surprised how much more revelation will flow in the body. A couple of members in this church have talked to me about that. After the service... Somebody will come to me and say, well, pastor, say from what you preach, what about this? And I'll say, whoa, I never thought about that. Why? Because there is no monopoly of revelation. Revelation actually flows through the body. And so, for example, if our church will learn how to flow into that, where a new guys talk about the word we learned, you'll be surprised. How you guys, you will begin to find yourself channels of revelation. Now, don't get pride kick and say, oh, ang galing-galing ko talaga, tamo na, alam, na, naisip ko to. No. The revelation is given to the body. Now, some of us are called by the Lord to speak more than others. I mean, I'm, I'm primarily the, the, I'm, I'm prim the primary teacher of this church. And so if God wants to teach the people, he has to allow revelation to flow through me. What if I'm no longer teaching? Now, of course, the revelation that's been there for years is, is already there. But what if... If uh, I don't, I'm not pastoring anymore, I, I speak once every three quarters, or, you know, why, why will God allow more revelation to flow through me? The reason why revelation is flowing through me is because I, I teach regularly. That's why pastors who doesn't teach, they say, well, I, I run out of knowledge. Of course, because you're not teaching. You're not allowing the revelation of the Lord to flow through you. That's why if after every service, when you fellowship, you you consider the word that the Lord has allowed us to learn and study on, you'll be surprised how much good thoughts and ideas will flow through you because of this body life and prayer. Okay? Let me end on this. Then his counsel. This is when God gently but specifically points us to his will. It's called counsel of the Lord. In the scripture, counsel is, is, is not just oh, counseling. Counsel is seeking God's will. 
you're about to start a business, you're about to start a family, you're going to engage yourself in a war, you seek the counsel of the Lord. It's to point you to His will. Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You know, when you seek that counsel, God will begin to give you counsel. This is what you should do. You know, I, I told you this so many times when, when the Lord uh, put it in my heart that I will come to America to study. Well, on the final year, God just gave me a counsel. For the Deut- Deuteronomy chapter 1, you have stayed long enough in this land. But that is not the only revelation. After that, I was reading, and the Lord points me to the scriptures, wherein when somebody's about to die, God says, prepare your house. So I've got those two things. I have, I have, I have stayed long enough in our camp in the Philippines. And the second thing is, I've prepared a prepared house. So that year, I prepared a house. When I left the church, there's a five-year plan on the operation of the Bible school. Five-year plan. I did not walk out saying, well, itsura nyo lang, tignan nyo, ha? Hindi nyo ako inappreciate. Anong mangyayari dyan? Na wala, no, I have a, a five-year plan. And, and uh, I, I, I even sat down with, with uh, my, my successor and began to guide her through a lot of things. And then I was no longer in the church, I, of course still my church. My pastor came to me one day and said, well, pastor was saying, well, he calls me brother Jose. He said, some of the members are still wondering why you're no longer in the staff. I said, well, Pastor Samuel, I, I told you I'm going to study. And he said, yeah, but they're still wondering. I don't want to keep answering questions. I, I told him, what do you want me to do? He said, why, why don't you teach? Because we have a, like a Sunday, we still Sunday school, before service teaching. He said, why don't you teach? So I said, okay. So I showed up every Friday and, and teach before the service. Sunday evening, teach before the service. Because you cannot have an atheist saying, well, let's see what will happen. Because that's, that's pride. Okay. Get God's counsel in your life. Let him point you to a direction that you should take. Make sure it's God's will. When you take that counsel, then he will get to know you. I have known God's provision all these years a lot more after I left the Philippines. The amount of miracles of provision that I have, I will never experience if I never follow the counsel of the Lord. So when God gives you counsel, you follow it, okay? Learn something tonight?